Hello everybody, uh, thanks for coming. This is about Linux tracing with BPF, BCC and more. Um, so my name is Alban. I'm a co-founder and a director at Cleanfort Labs, um, where we do consulting and engineering around open source projects uh, related to Linux and Kubernetes. And we have a team dedicated to uh, innovation on our own open source projects and collaborating with other software companies uh, on Amstrip project as well. Hello, so I'm Mauricio. I work also as a software engineer together with Alban, and this is my social network data, just in case you, you want to reach out. Hi, so I mentioned Kinfoc. We have uh, products and Linux uh, distribution and a Kubernetes distribution, but everything we will say today is not related to that. Uh, so you can try that on any Linux distribution or Kubernetes distribution. Okay, so this is the outline of the presentation we will give you today. Uh, we will present you an introduction to Linux tracing, then we will present you an introduction to BPF and BCC as well. I will do a quick demo about some BCC tools and will show you also how to customize a BCC tool. Finally, Alban will give you an introduction about tracing in the cloud. We'll show you what are the different tools available for that. And we'll present you a quick demo about Inspector Gadget. So I think we are ready to go. So let's get started with the introduction to Linux tracing. So before going into the details of the tracing in Linux, I want to give you a quick introduction about what tracing is. So tracing is a mechanism that allows to get information about the execution of a program. And we could say that there are two different use cases for tracing. One of them is for debugging and the other one is for troubleshooting. So debugging is the use case that usually programmers use. For instance, if you are developing an application and there is something that is not working with that application, you can use tracing to know what is going on. For instance, you can get some information about what are the functions that are being called, what are the arguments of those functions, and so on. On the other hand, uh, an administrator can use tracing for troubleshooting. So in this case, there is something that is not going good with an application. For instance, there is a performance problem or something similar. The administrator could enable the tracing in that application and get some details about what is going on again. Uh, the performance uh, in tracing is very important because we want this to be as low, the overhead to be as low as possible. So it should be able to disable or enable com uh, tracing at compile or runtime. Okay, so let's go in some details about uh, Linux tracing in particular. So we could say that uh, for Linux tracing, we can divide uh, it in three different layers. So the first layer are the data sources. So those are the components that provide information about what is going on. Those are the components that are connected to the applications or to the kernel and get the information. And this can be divided into different kinds. So we have the probes and we have the trace points. So the probes are a mechanism that allow to change the assembly code of an application at runtime. So Basically, there is an application that is running and this mechanism changes the code to introduce tracing at runtime. Uh, there are two kinds of probes. One, key probes are for kernel and user probes are for user space applications. The other kind of data sources that we have are the trace points. These are uh, defined statically by the programmer. So the programmer says, okay, there is something important happening in this point of my application. So I want to inform the world that something is happening in this point. Uh, again, there are two kinds of those trace points, one for the kernel and the other for the user space application. In this case, there are called user statically defined traces. Okay, so the second layer is the layer that takes the information from the data sources and make this information available to the third layer. There are different options here, here. Actually, there are many different options here, but I don't want to go into the details of those all options. Mm, those use different technologies. Some of them are integrated into the Linux kernel. Some of them are external modules and so on. Uh, what I only want to be clear here is that there are different options that could be chosen according to the needs of the user. OK, 
Okay, so usually the data extraction at the data sources layers run in kernel space. And we have the third layer that is the front ends that run in user space. So the front ends is the layer that presents the information that makes the tracing information available to the user. Once again, here there are different options. There are different tools. Mm, okay, so the compatibility between these three layers is not that straightforward. Mm, there are some tools that are, are only compatible. What I mean is that there are some front ends that are only compatible with some data extraction layers and so on. I don't want to plot all the compatibility arrows here, but just to show you that there are many different options and according to the front end that you choose, you should, should choose some data extraction component and so on. In this talk, we will concentrate particularly in BCC and BPF. Mm. I don't want to say that this is the only system option or that this is the best option, but we want to present this one because we think it has some nice feature and some nice advantages. Okay, so why are we talking specifically about BPF and BCC here? The first reason is that those are fully open source solutions. For the BPF case, this is a very flexible and efficient technology, and this is included in the Linux kernel. It means that you don't have to install an external kernel module to make it work. For the BCC case, it has many and great already system tools. So it's like, it's ready to use. You don't have to modify that in most of the cases. Uh, and even if you want to modify that, this is very flexible and easy to modify. I will show you a demo about that later on. And um, BCC also have uh, libraries of bindings available for some programming languages. So it, it has a lot of compatibility with different programming languages. And an important factor for us is that there is a helpful community around. So if you hit any issues, if you have any questions, there is always a community willing to help you. Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, so now we'll introduce uh, BPF. Uh, so BPF itself is something that existed for quite a long time. Uh, it was initially designed for TCP dump, but uh, more recently it was extended into eBPF, extended BPF. Um, and um, one of the change um, from this initial use case for TCP dump for network uh, capturing network packets uh, is uh, now it can do more things than that. You can trace, you can have a new kind of uh, program uh, for tracing. It has a BPF system call that I will uh, explain a bit later. Uh, that was not there before. And it has something called BPF maps that I will explain after as well. And finally, it has um, a BPF file system, uh, which uh, can be interesting for uh, managing the BPF objects. Okay, so uh, here I want to uh, present the workflow, the general workflow, how it works, like um, a bit behind the scene, what will happen when, uh, when you write a BPF program and when you load it. So first we look at the top. Uh, when you write a BPF program, you write some code in C. And that uh, program in C uh, can be compiled with the C long LLVM into a BPF bytecode. And uh, this BPF bytecode uh, can be then uh, used with a BPF system call to load it into the kernel. And once your uh, BPF bytecode is loaded into the kernel, the first thing that the kernel will do is to verify, uh, so there is this uh, step called the verification from the verifier uh, that will verify that your program is safe. Uh, so this is to ensure that it will not crash your kernel and it will not do anything dangerous that should not happen. I will go back to that a bit later. Uh, if the verifier say the program is uh, safe to run, then it is uh, in the kernel and it can be attached a letter to um, one of the hook I will describe in a bit, in a moment. Uh, then this BPF program can call uh, kernel functions um, with a BPF helper functions and it can interact with the eBPF maps. Um, that's the latest mechanism I will explain a bit uh, soon. Okay, and then uh, uh, 
the BPF program, when it is executing, it interacts with the application only through the BPF apps. So that's a communication mechanism to retrieve information from the kernel into uh, the tracing application. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, there are different kinds of BPF programs. Now that we have eBPF, um, it's not only for TCP dump anymore, but it's for more use case. Uh, here, there are three categories about networking, um, about security, and about tracing. But in this talk, we will focus only on the uh, tracing. Uh, so it's about using BPF program of type Kprobe or TracePoint or Uprobe and a few others that um, Mauricio mentioned before. And um, so a BPF program can be attached to different uh, hooks in the kernel in that way. Uh, BPF programs can use a BPF maps. A map is kind of a global variable that, uh, on, that is on the Linux system. And that variable uh, is accessible both by, by the programs, by user space programs, uh, using the BPF system calls. Or it can be available from uh, different BPF programs uh, using the BPF helper function. Uh, so I don't mean to go into this uh, details of the API. I just want to show that it, it is a mechanism uh, for many, it is used for BPF programs to transmit information to the user space program. Okay. Uh, there are many different kinds of BPF maps. And that's an uh, area that is always in development in the Linux kernel. So there was initially only a few maps about uh, different data structures like uh, array or hash table. Uh, but uh, in the latest kernel, I checked there is uh, 27 different types of maps now. Uh, so there are many different kinds of uh, data structure, including uh, different kind of ring buffers to uh, transmit information from the kernel into user space. And there are some uh, specialized data structure, for example, Logos, Logos prefix match or Q uh, and so on. Um, how do we use the map? Um, yeah, uh, there is this BPF uh, system call that you can use to create a map. Um, but when you are on the terminal, you can use this uh, command line tool, BPF tool, to create a map and then you can make it visible on the BPF file system. Okay, thank you Alban for that nice introduction about BPF. So I will continue with the introduction to BCC. So BCC stands for BPF Compiler Collation. So and BCC is a toolkit that, uh, for creating efficient kernel tracing and manipulation programs. Uh, this definition means that B BCC makes it easier to write BPF programs. When you are writing a BPF program, usually you have to take care about some of the lower details of the kernel and it makes it sometimes difficult to write. So BCC tries to make it a bit easier by providing a wrapper. So BCC provides a wrapper around LABN that allows you to access the BPF maps to define the maps in an easier way. Mm, BCC also provides some libraries for Python, Lua, and C++, also for Golan externally by a different project called GoBPF. So what it means is that you still have to write your BPF program using C, but you can control that program. You can load and as access the BPF maps using other languages like Python, Lua, and so on. So this is the first part about this BCC is about providing the user a framework, a library to create, to load and to manipulate uh, BPF programs. That's just only one part of the BCC toolkit. The other part that I will say that could be, it could be the most important one is that it has a lot of different tools and examples that are ready to use. So this, is like the big picture of BCC where we have here the different kernel subsystems and we have some, maybe some of the BCC tools that are out of there. So we can see here how there are different tools and how they interact with different kernel subsystems. As you can see, there are many different tools, almost there is a different tool for each subsystem. 
In this talk, I will present you a quick demo about some of these tools, particularly about OpenSNOP, SXNOP, about, and TCP Connect. If you want to get more information about these tools, you can go to the uh, BCC repo and you can see the list of the different tools that are there. You can see a small summary, a small description about the tool. If you click the name, the, then you can get, you can have the full documentation about that specific tool. And there are also some examples about how to use those tools. So before going into the demo, there are different options to install BCC. The first option is to install a package, a package for your distro. So if you are running Ubuntu, Fedora, or a popular distro, there are packages available for that one. Uh, if you don't want to install anything on your system or you are running a different Linux distribution, you could run BCC on Docker. In this case, you want to provide some special flags. So I just put in the command here in case you want to, to run this. Mm, there is a small detail. There is, not an of, there is not an official BCC Docker image. So at Kingfall, we have some images that we maintain time to time with the BCC functionalities. The last one is if you want to develop BCC or you want to try a feature that has not been released yet, you could install from source. In this case, this is needed to make some attention about the dependencies, especially the kernel. In order to compile BCC, we will have to be running the latest kernel. Okay, so this is time for a demo. So let me switch to my terminal. Okay, so here I have the different BCC tools on my system. Mm, this is actually known uh, BCC installation by running, I have here a git clone of the BCC repo. So as you can see here, those are the different tools that BCC includes. Okay, so let me show you OpenSNOP. So we can, if we want to get more information about a tool, we can run always with the, this option to get some help. So for instance, we can, we can see a small description about what the tool is about. We can get information about the arguments that can be used and so on. Okay, so the OpenSNOP tool allows to get information about open, open files on the system. So it shows when a process tries to open a file, right? So the easiest way to execute a BCC tool is to execute as user or uh, as root user without any comments. So just let me introduce my password. It takes some time until it loads. Okay, so as you can see here, there are a lot of different uh, processes open a lot of different files on my system. Hmm. If I want to trace only the files of a given process, I can use this option. So this option traces all, only the files of a process that has cat in the name. So let's try to run some cat commands here. Okay, so as you can see here, we get information about this execution of the cat command. So we get the PID of the process, we get the name of the command, we get also information about the number of the file descriptor inside the, that process. We get if there was an error or not, and we also get information about the path that the process was opening. So in summary, OpenSNOP allows you to have information about what are the processes that are opening different files on the system. Okay, so let me show you uh, very, another very simple tool that is called SXNOP. So this tool allows us to get information about new processes that are being created on the host. So once again, let's execute that. We wrote permissions in this case without any parameter. So, okay, and let's run some commands. Let's do a cut, let's do a pin command. Okay, so again, here we have the information about those commands. We have what is the name of the command. We have what is the PID of that process. We have the information about the parent process ID. Uh, and yes, some additional information about the arguments used on the command and so on. So this tool allows you to get information about what are the different processes that are being created in your host? 
Okay, so finally, I want to show you another tool. This is called TCP Connect. So this tool allows us to get information about the different TCP connections that are being created from the host. So in other words, when a process tries to call the connect syscall for the TCP protocol, it prints that information on the screen. So again, we can run the tool without any commands. And then we can try to open some TCP connections. So let me try to Kingfolk and let me try to open to Google. And okay, so we have also some information here. We have information about what, are, what was the PID uh, performing that operation, what was the command, what is the source address, in this case, the address of my computer, what is the destination address, and what is the uh, destination port of the request. So this tool is useful to understand what are the processes that are trying to open TCP connections to a remote host. Okay, so as, as you can see, there are many different tools available. You can go to the report and get information about those tools. Basically, uh, you will find a tool for all the tasks that you need to do. But it could happen in some cases that you want to do something special that is not implemented in some of those tools. Maybe you need to create a new tool or you need to customize an already existing tool. So I will show you quickly how to customize an already existing BCC tool. Before showing you the code, I want to present you how a BCC tool is done. So the BCC tools are composed are composed by two different things. One is the BPF program and another one is the user space script. So the BPF program is the piece of the tool that runs in the kernel. It captures and filters events. So it's attached to a key pro, you proof and so on. Take, takes the events from the kernel, perform some filtering, and then sends those events to the user space script using a buffer. In this case, a pairing buffer that is a kind of BPF map. Then the user space script, what does is to parse, parse the user options. It customize the BPF code according to the user options. We will see this in detail later on. Then it attaches the BPF program to the kernel. And finally, it runs a loop uh, pulling this BPF map and printing these events in a human readable way. So here we have the two different components of the of our BCC tool. We have user space, we have kernel space. So this is the user space component of the BCC tool that uses the BCC Python bindings to create and to compile the BCC tool and then to attach that. So use these bindings to attach the tool. When the tool is attached, a BPF program is created in the kernel and this is loaded to the trace point, key pros, and improves, and so on. This program takes those events, saves those events in the map, and then the BCC tool uses the poll to get information about those events. Okay, so let me show you uh, a quick demo about how to modify an already existing tool. So I'm going to use the last tool I present to you, TCP Connect. So as you can see here for TCP Connect, we can filter the events based on the PID, based on the port, but we can filter the events based on the destination IP address. So Let's suppose that for some reason you want to filter the, these events based on a destination IP address. So I will show you how to extend this tool to perform that operation. Okay, so this is the TCP Connect tool. This is a Python script with all the tool. I will go show you quickly how this is done. So we have the imports here to import the different functionalities that we need, some of them are for VCC and some of them are for the generic Python libraries. Here we have the information about the different options that are exposed to the user. 
and here we have the BPF program. So the BPF program defines some maps to send that information to the user space uh, application and so on. We have some definition of the structure. And this is not important for you to understand all of these details here. I want to show, I only want to show you a general overview of the program. Okay, so those, these are some of the functions that are called each time an event happens. For instance, each time there is a call to the connect syscall, this function is executed, and there is the logic to collect the information for that. So as you can see here and here, there are something like a filtering, uh, something like a C macros. So these macros are the filtering mechanism. So these macros are, the, are then replaced by this tool in order to perform the filter if the user wants to enable the filter by that option. I will show you in, in a second how it works. Okay, and here we have some more information about some more code for getting the event, for getting the full information of the event from the kernel. And again, here we have more and more code. So basically what happens is that the code is divided in different pieces and then the BCC Python script in user space put everything together, compiles the script and loads the BPF program into the kernel. Okay, so as you can see here, based on the, on the user options, there are some cop substitutions. So for instance, if the user only wants to count, so we, we use this code, otherwise they use this one. Uh, if the user wants to filter by PID, so we replace this macro by this implementation that performs a filter. So usually a filter in BPF is something like comparing a condition. If the condition is not true, returning zero to avoid capturing the event. The same happened here in ports, so in ports. So we have a condition here. If the condition is not true, then we just return uh, return zero to avoid capture and event, right? So let me show you how to modify this. So what we want to do is to filter by destination IP address. So the first thing that we want that we have to do is to add an option for the user to specify the, uh, the IP address to filter. So we can reuse the same port. We can copy and paste. Okay, okay and I'm going to show to call it a address, right? And okay, here we just have to put some documentation. Okay, so I have the option here. Then I need to look into the PPF program where the destination address is available. So if we go here, here we have the we have the filter for the for the port, and here we have some code for the IPv4 a specific case. So if we go here, we have that the, we have the destination IP address here. So what we can do is filter IPv4. So as you can see, I'm not implementing the filter here, I just add in this string that is going to be replaced by the BCC uh, when loading the, the program. So, okay. Okay, so what I have to do now to do next is define this filter. So what this filter is. So again, we can just use the same logic that is for the port. So if our point to address, okay, so we have the IP that is going to be equal to, to something. I'm going to, I'm going to show you this in a second. And then we are going to replace the test. So in this case, this is called, this is called IP. If IP is different to something, we are going to do the same logic to avoid capturing the event. And this is going to be IP. And this, instead of being port, this is called IPv4. So, what is the IP? So the IP address that we have here is an integer that is safe on network by ordering and 
probably this is easier for the user to provide this destination IP using the decimal notation. So we have to convert for, from decimal notation to a network by ordering. So I'm just going to copy paste that to avoid losing some time on how to do that. Okay, so basically what we are doing here is that we are taking the argument from the user, we are conve converting that to IP address object using this library from Python. We are convert converting that to an integer and finally we are converting that to a host network by ordering representation. Right. Here we have also to define this to replace the filter. This is in case the user doesn't want to filter by destination IP address. So I think we are almost ready to go. And the only thing we are missing is to import some of the extra functions that we are using. So we have a host to network clone, and we have also the one about IP address. Okay, so we modify the tool so we can try the tool again. Okay, so before trying anything, I just want to run the tool without any command, just to be sure that it is still working. Okay, this time I want to get the addresses of these domains just to do this with the address. So we try to core to this address, we can see that if we have even here, we will try to call to this address. Okay, we also have the information there. So let's suppose that we only want to trace the this one. Oh, I got a small error. Let me check that. Okay, I know what went wrong. So in the filter here, I'm using IP, but this should be the destination IP address. So this destination IP address is say on this variable. So instead of IP, we have to use this variable that is the one defined in the BPF code. So let's try it again. Okay, so if we try to core to this address, we can see that there is no any event there. If we try to core to the, this address, we can see that the event is there. Even if we try to core to a different port, the event is also captured there. So as you can see, this is not that difficult to modify the BCC tool. So if I show you the difference, you can see that this is very few lines of codes in the change. So you can modify the tool very easily. Okay, I think this is all from my side. I hope it was some more or less clear how to modify the BCC tool. I give the word to Alban that will show you how to use BCC in a environment, in a cloud environment. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, yes, what we have seen so far is uh, using BCC on a single machine. And instead, uh, what I want to talk about is when you want to use it on a cloud, meaning when you have many machines to uh, uh, to inspect. Uh, so in this case, it's a bit more complicated because in this kind of scenario, um, the user will not necessarily uh, want to SSH an individual machine to test that. Uh, that's something we want to avoid. And sometimes um, the we don't want uh, to trace at the granularity of one process or even one node. Uh, it can happen, for example, that you run Nginx on different nodes, so you have many replicas of the Nginx application running, and you might want to trace all of them. And if you have a load balancer, you don't necessarily know which, uh, uh, which node the traffic is going to target. Uh, 
Um, so those are some kind of limitation uh, if you want to use directly BCC on the cloud. Um, and we will see how we can uh, overcome that. Um, here as um, I put on the left uh, side different uh, kind of uh, Linux tracing tool, including BCC, uh, that are uh, designed to run on one uh, machine. On, on the right, I put some tools which are more on the Kubernetes level. Uh, so when you have much different machine, many different machines that you want to trace uh, using uh, high level tools rather than connecting to a specific machine. Uh, in this example, you have kubectl trace to use the BPF trace tool. Uh, in the case of BCC, you can use Inspector Gadget and it has some support for some of the uh, tools that Maurice show, uh, showed before. Um, I will not make a big demo of that because there is actually another talk uh, in this conference um, about, it's a tutorial for Kubernetes and BPF. Uh, it's, uh, it's already gone uh, on, on that date, uh, Tuesday, October 27, uh, but you can see a recording from the talk. Or if you want to see, um, to do that by yourself, you can go to this repository uh, at github.com slash kinfog slash cloud native BPF workshop, uh, where you can reproduce the workshop and see um, how you can learn how to use Inspector Gadget, kubectl and so on. Uh, but for today, I will just uh, show you um, a short uh, demo um, of Inspector Gadget, uh, a very short one. So I will share my screen just one second. Uh, here it is. So here you see my terminal uh, are split in two. Um, at the bottom, uh, let's see, I have a Kubernetes uh, cluster. Uh, actually, it's just one node. Uh, I started with Minikube, which is a tool to start a virtual machine on your uh, laptop and have a Kubernetes cluster running there. Um, here I see with the kubectl command that I don't have any pod running. Um, and in the other terminal, what I will do at the top is to run uh, the kubectl gadget um, tool uh, with the exec snoop uh, command. Uh, so this exec snoop command is directly taken from BCC. Um, that's the exec snoop tool that Mauricio demoed before. And uh, on top of that, uh, the kubectl gadget command will allow you to specify uh, which pod uh, you want to trace. In this case, um, there are different ways to select the pod, by the pod name and so on. In this case, I will select it by specifying the Kubernetes namespace, uh, the default one, and um, selecting the labels uh, run equal cooking. So let's try that, see what happened. Um, as I mentioned before, I only have one node um, in my Kubernetes cluster, it's called minikube in that case. And here, it, it has started the exec snoop command. Uh, um, so far, it doesn't trace anything because there are no pods that uh, match this level. So let me, uh, this time, try to uh, start a new pod. Uh, this pod is called cooking, so it will have this uh, only called cooking level and it will um, run this script. Um, so it used this anti-pattern curl by bash just for the purpose of this demo. Um, let's see what happened there. Uh, if I can use exec snoop on this pod. Uh, so here you see the script is doing something and at the top of the screen, you see all the commands that uh, this script is running. So you can see, for example, cat, uh, grab, and all the command that um, this shell script is running. Here I see it's installing something, and I can see that it's using RPM to install that. Um, so that's uh, what you can do with Inspector Gadget. It uses uh, BCC tools behind the scene on, on the different nodes of your Kubernetes cluster. Thank you. Okay, just let me share my screen again. Okay, so before finishing this presentation, 
In the slides, we have some reference material just in case you want to know more information about that. Here you can find a lot of different information about how to use BCC, how to use BPF, how to use Inspector Gadget, and the different tools and technologies we show you in this uh, presentation. So I think this is all. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation.